Now, breaking news here, Donna, you've probably seen this already in Progressive Dairy. It says a benefit to cows, the land and profitability of the farm, fresh grass for high producing dairy cows. So that's a new discovery. Dairy cows can actually eat fresh grass and, and produce milk from it. Uh, we're going to talk a not, not a whole lot about dairy cows. Well, Donna's uh, the specialist in dairy production, um, but some of you do have um, animals that you're milking. But we're going to talk about mainly the forages and how to use those and how to produce um, good livestock gain, um, good milk, good wool, whatever. But we're mainly talking about how you take the forage and convert it into um, a useful product. Um, so this is just a real quick overview, kind of like an overview of the whole grazing school, the benefits of improved grazing. So Greg Hallett will talk to us tomorrow in economics, and, and he, he'll, he'll comment, this is not a universal statement, but it's almost universal, that grazing is the cheapest, or at least one of the cheapest sources of nutrients. I mean, maybe you get some slop from a local distillery that they give you for free, you still got to haul it, um, but, but mainly if an animal's getting the feed themselves and you're not having to harvest it, uh, then, you, then you really reduce the cost. And, and obviously that's how animals are made to get their, their um, feed. So just an example of cost ratios. If a grazed pasture is 100, then hay typically is twice as much. Um, you get into Silage, it's even more because it's, it's more of an effort. You've got you to have that preservation, whether it's plastic or a silo. You get into concentrates, you're talking three to four times as much cost as grazing. A lot of the profitability of the farm depends on your ratio of how much hay you're feeding versus how much you're grazing. Um, so uh, the, shorter the, the shorter the hay feeding season, generally, the more you're going to make. Uh, well, here are some examples of um, improving the profitability with hay feeding, like Greg will talk about bale grazing, things like that tomorrow. But again, pretty much a universal statement. If you want to be profitable, if you can limit that, time, that amount of time that you're feeding hay or concentrates, um, you're making more money. So we're going to talk about optimizing grazing, using more of what we produce, using it at a higher quality stage, um, using it more days of the year. So... I'm going to go through a whole list of different ways that improved grazing practices um, can in, improve your operation. One is the utilization. Talking about the utilization of how much is out there versus how much the animals are actually consuming. So if you went out and did a green chop, meaning you cut the material green and you fed it directly, that's actually what they were talking about in this dairy article. Uh, probably not many of us are going to do that. But you're going to utilize just about everything because you're actually cutting it and bringing it to them green. But obviously you don't have much storage there. If you go into haylage or hay, typically you're going to get 70 to 80% of what you cut as far as what they're eating, depending how you're going about feeding it. When you get into strip grazing where you're just giving them um, half a day or a day's worth of grazing each day, then there's much less trampling because they're pretty well eating most of what's there. So that's, you're getting maximum efficiency with grazing. When you move into different rotations, you rotate every couple of days, you typically have about a 55 to 70 percent utilization. Um, you go down to a longer rotation period, um, they're going to not eat as much, they're going to trample more. But to get down into continuous grazing, <coughs> excuse me, get into continuous grazing and you've got 20 to 50 percent utilization what's there versus what they actually consume. Um, Chris, we have a bottle of water. Okay, great. I get so excited about this, I just get all choked up talking to you guys. <clears throat> okay, another benefit of improved grazing is the yield, is the production of the forage. Um, and we can think about that both from a yield with forage, but we can also think about that with animals. So we're talking about an increase in gain per acre. This is gain on the animals um, with rotational compared to continuous grazing. A study in Arkansas showed a 44% increase. One in Georgia showed a 37% increase. Oklahoma showed a 35% increase in gain per acre. Um, 
alfalfa orchard grass with rotational compared to continuous grazing from a study in Virginia Tech a few years ago. Carrying capacity increased by 43%, milk production by 40%. Another benefit is improved quality, the nutritional value of the forage. You're controlling what the animals consume rather than them controlling it. Um, and so you can, uh, you have a lot, a lot of control over the quality based on what stage they're grazing it at. Um, for an example, animals, this is from a study at University of Florida, um, the percent leaves that are being grazed with rotational grazing, 40 to 50 percent, continuous grazing less. Leaves are higher quality. Typically with legumes like clovers and alfalfa, the leaves are 30 percent protein. The stems tend to be about 10 percent. So if they're consuming more leaves, they're getting higher quality. Gains per acre um, versus gains per animal. Now, if you want to get maximum gains per animal, and in Kentucky on really good land, we'll talk about um, a cow per every two acres. A lot of the land that we have in pastures, we're probably talking about um, a cow or cow-calf pair per three or four acres. If you want to say, I want to get maximum gain per animal, you could go with one cow-calf pair for 10 acres on good soil, get really good gain per animal, but you're probably not going to make much profits. So we really want to encourage you to think about what are your gains that you're getting per acre. Even if every one of your animals is not showing the, the very best average daily gains, but typically you're going to make more if you're making more gains per acre. Okay, extending the grazing season. The way you feed less hay is you graze more of the season. If, you've, if you're controlling what the animals consume, then you can hold some things back. You can go into things like stockpiled grazing. In Kentucky, um, the, main, the main forage growth is in the spring months of April, May, and June. So we have a big peak here because most of what we have are cool season forages. Um, the fescue, the orchard grass, the clovers. They typically dip in the summer um, when it gets hot, hot and drier, and they pick back up in the fall. So we've got a gap in the summer. We've got a gap in the late fall winter period. Anything you can do to try to get forages growing or have forages still there in the field during those gap periods um, can help you stretch out your grazing season. So if you get an, even just an extra month of grazing, say the month of November, um, that's going to save, you know, if, if it's half the cost of grazing versus feeding hay or feeding concentrates, um, then that's money in your pocket. Stand persistence. We like to have forages that are high quality and long lived, but forages like alfalfa or red clover, they don't handle repeated grazing. Um, and so being able to control the grazing gives better stand persistence. Um, we'll actually be grazing some alfalfa in the groups when we go out to the farm in a little bit. Um, native grasses, um, several of you are with NRCS. There's a number of cost share programs offered for people to plant things like big blue stem or switchgrass or Indian grass. Very productive, very good summer growth, but they've got to have a rest period to survive. Um, if they have a rest period and, you, and you're patient in the establishment, you're talking about stands that are 10 or 20 years old. Animal performance is another benefit of improved grazing, as I've already mentioned a couple of times. Um, so this study that um, Carl Hovland, who was um, part of my um, one of my professors when I was at University of Georgia, he found that the percent change in rot with rotational grazing over continuous, he increased stocking rate in this study by 38%. Calf gain per acre was increased by 37%. Hay fed per cow was um, minus 32%. Animal health. Um, part of the benefit of improved grazing on animal health is you're checking the animals more often than just kind of leaving them out there. But there's a lot of other benefits um, in improved health, and you'll hear some about that as we move through the next couple of days. You have better environmental benefits if you're controlling where the animals are grazing. They're not in the pond all the time. They're not in the, they're not in the creek all the time. Um, they're not in one spot all the time um, with all the urine and all the manure going in that one spot. We'll talk a lot about temporary water system, temporary fence systems the next couple of days. Okay, this is a farmer, when I was in 
um, Virginia, teaching at Virginia Tech, um, J.C. Winstead. Um, this is J.C.'s hillside farm. Um, when he got the farm, it looked like his neighbor's farm on the right, um, full of Osage orange and locusts and all kind of um, things. And over a period of time, um, I think it probably took J.C. about 10 years to get the farm looking like it does on the left. But just gradual improvements with rotational grazing, with getting those shrubs down, with, with some judicious use of herbicides. He's got a very productive farm. Um, even on those slopes, you can see the kind of cover that he's got. Um, has done very well over the years um, raising stalkers on that farm. Started out with sheep, but there in the mountains of Virginia, there's um, many um, other animals that like to eat sheep, so he decided to go with stalkers. Okay, so we're going to talk about grazing management you want to remember a good little acronym. Uh, value is keeping your pastures vegetative, available, keeping legumes there, using good utilization and good efficiency. I um, mean, the economics, you'll hear a lot more from Greg tomorrow. Uh, you know, an example that we often use is a number of years ago when uh, Wisconsin dairy farmers, there's a lot of dairy farmers there, just a second, um, started doing more grazing with their dairy herd. And what they found, they were getting a higher net income per cow. They were having a lower investment per cow. They had an increase in net farm income. Now notice I didn't say higher milk production per cow uh, because they weren't being, they, they didn't have the maximum nutrition that you can get with grains, but they were making more money per cow, higher net farm income. So make sure you think about that in your operation. So, everyday grazed is money saved. It's not universally true, as Greg will mention tomorrow, uh, but most every day that is true. I want to encourage you to look at our um, website called, um, for, our, our forage extension website. I always go there just by Googling KY forages. Um, just as um, coming to this grazing school, we will give you forage news, um, send you that in an email. Um, just let us know if you do not want to get that, um, but that's a monthly newsletter. Um, and you see a number of other things here, particularly with the events you see right here at the top. Um, okay, this is the slides from 2019, Chris, so we will advertise the Heart of America conference. Um, Oh, yeah, that's why I put it there. Um, not that I just forgot it was there. That's because the advertiser used to channel, Chris. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you go there to, the, to our website, you can click there on the YouTube channel. Or you can just Google YouTube KY Forages. And you get, um, Chris, the last five, six, even more years of presentations from here. And even some, Chris, some of the ones you did in, in Virginia. You had a question? Okay. Well, we'll talk a lot more about that. First comment to make, so her question was about a hay field, that they they want to let the grass grow and, and graze it in the winter, and, and, and when did they turn it out? We'll talk a lot more about that, but two points I want to make. One is, we'd really like to encourage you not to think about anything as just a hay field. If you're able to get a fence, even a temporary fence, then that could be useful for pasture. Um, and when you turn them out on that is kind of when you, when you, when you need it. Um, but typically, the growth of the existing grasses is slowing down as we get into late October, November. Um, and pretty well, the growth stops in Kentucky in, you know, late November. And so, you might as well let it keep growing if you're keeping it for stockpiling to get maximum production. And then, you may leave it for a month and graze it in January. Or you may go ahead and start in, in December with grazing. Uh, when we talk about stockpile grazing, we'll talk about the different things. But tall fescue, one of its... It's got some negatives we'll mention tomorrow, but it's got some real positives in its ability to hold up uh, under rainfall and even snow and maintain its quality.
So follow back up tomorrow if we haven't answered some of those questions.